Folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a very warm welcome uh, to this webinar here. Uh, we had uh, a very big release. We'd like to close out the year strong, and R3 2021 was a big release, and uh, we are here to cover all the goodness uh, for developer productivity over the next uh, two hours. So we are going to talk about reporting, uh, Fiddler, Chessmock, and Test Studio. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, uh, we are actually uh, quite a team here. Uh, I got some experts uh, pulled in together here. Um, so it should be a fun two hours. So uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'm your host, Sam Basu. I'm going to stay on uh, with you all through. Uh, but with me, I have some uh, amazing folks here. Uh, so I'm going to ask each one of you to introduce yourself, uh, starting with Rick. Hi, Rick Elwidge. I'm a principal sales engineer. I work with the .NET platform tools, reporting, and pretty much everything Telic offers under .NET. Awesome. And Eve. Hello, my name is Eve Terzillo, and I'm a developer advocate. I work alongside Sam, and my role is to handle all things related to the Fiddler family of products. Excellent. And Mihail. Hello, my name is Mikhail Vladov, and I am the engineering major and project uh, product major of uh, JustMock. All right, and Andrew. Hello, my name is Andrew Wheeland, and I am a sales engineer, and I'll be showing off some testing and uh, QA automation tools today. Awesome. So while uh, you see uh, the five of us, five of us on camera, uh, this is still actually not the whole team. We have some product engineers and uh, PMs in our back chat, in the back rooms. Uh, you are giving us uh, like two hours of your day, uh, so we are thankful. Uh, but let's make uh, the most of it. So ask questions. Uh, so we can answer all of it. Uh, there's a Q&A panel, and uh, I'll, I'll show you a slide with some social media stuff if you want to ask uh, on social media so we can uh, leave a breadcrumb trail. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started. We are all about developer productivity, right? Uh, we want to um, make you successful. Uh, that's our job. And we kind of started, uh, so the release went out um, about 10 days back, and we started uh, the festivities uh, this Monday. Uh, we actually had all things JavaScript, uh, the Kendo UI uh, webinar, which talked about Kendo UI for Angular, jQuery, React, and Vue. Yesterday, we did the .NET webinar, which is uh, Ed and me talking about all things .NET across web, desktop, and, uh, and mobile. But today, we get to talk about something that kind of spans across all of .NET, JavaScript, pretty much whatever type of dev you're doing, you need some of these things uh, to be productive in your enterprise workflows. So how are you doing on reporting? How are you doing on testing? Um, how are you doing on uh, you know, unit testing and mocking? And uh, of course, Fiddler, uh, you should not be in, in, in any doubt as to what's going on in your network stack. So we have two hours and uh, we're gonna get into all of this goodness. Uh, there is a lot uh, of love that's been poured into this release. So we're excited to kind of bring you all that uh, and unpack. Um, before we start, though, um, if you have to leave or if you have anything uh, going on with your connection, uh, you have meetings, that's totally understandable. Uh, we would love you uh, for you to kind of stay on because sometimes a lot of you have uh, Telerik DevCraft and you might not realize that you have all of this goodness uh, in your basket. So it kind of gets you uh, inspired to kind of look around on the product suites that you might not be using. Um, but if you, uh, again, um, want to catch up on this, this is being recorded in high def and we shall push this out to YouTube as soon as we can. Um, like I said, keep using the Q&A panel to ask us questions, but if you are on, on the Twitter, then use the hashtag HeyTelerik. Uh, that way we can get back to you even after the webinar. We can leave a breadcrumb trail. Uh, so R3 2021 is here. It's a feature-packed release uh, with .NET and JavaScript goodies, but also uh, all of the other things that make us productive in our enterprise workflows. The things that enterprises need, um, that's the thing that we are uh, going to talk about today. Reporting and uh, you know testing and all the good stuff. Um, but Again, it's a lot to cover. Again, even like two hours uh, sounds like short enough because we are covering five different products here um, and also the .NET and the JavaScript stuff that we did talk about. If you need to get into more of the details as to what exactly is going on in, in Test Studio, what exactly is new with Fiddler Jam, uh, check out our blogs. That's blogs.telery.com. Every product team and the engineers and the PMs, they all take the time to write up a thorough post on exactly what's changed. So that, that way you know. Um, and again, while you're there, look around at some of the other products. Um, it might just inspire you to uh, use something that you are not. So check out the blogs and uh, get started there. And like we always say, uh, we are all about uh, developer success. 
So uh, you should not be struggling. You should be having a good time getting started with our docs and kind of troubleshooting. Uh, check out the demos. They are always uh, out there to kind of get you uh, thinking as to uh, what our products and what our some of the UI components can do for you. And then uh, whatever suggestions you might have in terms of product features or something you want to see uh, fixed, uh, feedback.today.com. Again, our engineers, uh, our DevRel, our PMs, we are always listening. Uh, to your feedback. So feedback.tenary.com. Tell us uh, what you want to see next and uh, we'll get that going. All right. So with that, um, we're going to break this up. Um, so let's do reporting first. Then we're going to go to Fiddler, then just pop, then testing. So uh, with reporting, let's get started. And I have my good friend Rick here to give me company. So Rick, uh, feel free to turn on your microphone and um, <clears throat> kind of walk me through this. Um, I always like starting off uh, setting the stage because like reporting is so key. Uh, to pretty much any enterprise workflow. We have tons and tons of data, all right? It's, it's 2022 almost. Uh, so how do we make sense of all this um, data? Uh, and, and how do we get to the patterns and correlations and how to make decisions off our data? That, that's not easy, right? And this is where I think like data visualizations really help because you're letting me visualize um, the trends and the patterns that, uh, that are in our data. So, uh, Andy, I'm going to let you, not Andy, sorry, Rick, I'm going to let you uh, speak to reporting for a minute here. Tell us what reporting does. Absolutely. I have a nice one-liner. So Telic Reporting is our UI agnostic .NET centric platform for creating, viewing, and maintaining beautiful page-based reports. So you kind of pick that apart. What it is, it's, a, it's a, an SDK, it's a Swiss Army knife for adding reporting features into your .NET applications and truly any .NET application from classic um, WinForms all the way through uh, WinUI, um, which goes well with platform technologies, I'm Blazor, uh, web technologies, um, and any .NET platform through uh, .NET 6. Um, so it is a fully, um, it's a fully capable platform with a number of report viewers, um, number of report designers, report writers, and super performant rendering engine uh, to sort of add these features into your new or existing applications. Okay, that's that's a loaded one-liner. Uh, that's that's well said. And I, I like the fact that this is maybe catering to .NET developers, but like you said, like the report viewers, like you can run these reports and deliver them to pretty much every platform. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have report viewers for Angular, React, uh, Blazor, anything you can imagine, plain JavaScript, which basically means you can put it anywhere you want. Yeah. So I, I, I pulled this uh, from uh, kind of more of the details of what uh, our reporting solution entails. And to me, like reporting is such a key part of like most workflows, but we don't realize some of the pieces that make up reporting. Like first thing is you have your data. Uh, that might be coming from any number of data sources based on what your enterprise is doing. Uh, then you have to have REST services that pull that data, and then you have to actually build the report, right? So, um, Rick, we have a few report designers as to how we go about doing this. We do. We actually have three report designers, one built into Visual Studio for a fully code-based designing environment, if you want to go that route. We have a Windows uh, platform report designer because it's a platform tool, definitely the fastest and most snappy designer out there. And that creates reports as an XML file. Again, totally cross compatible. And we also have a relatively new but amazingly powerful web based report designer. So if you want to ex expose report creation to end users really easily, you can just put it on directly in the web app, in the platform app. Um, and let them uh, design and modify the reports, you know, in one place. Yeah, I, I love the new web report designer. It's amazing to see like what we can pull off on on the modern webs uh, these days. So that's just building the report, and then like Rick said, like visualizing it and delivering your reports. Uh, that's really on any platform that you want. And of course, with any reporting system, you need to be able to export and, and deliver your reports, and you have a multitude of uh, kind of platforms and technologies to kind of rest on in terms of exporting your reports out. So we will talk a lot more about the web report designer because we're excited about that. Um, but let's kind of get into a little bit more of the crux of it. So again, your reports are going to need UI. That's the key of data visualization, and you 
want to report in a solution that gets all of the components out of the box. And, and that's kind of what we try to offer with generic reporting. Uh, but we also have generic report server, which is kind of more of a turnkey solution. Um, and Rick, do you want to speak to that again? Sure. So where the telework reporting is um, a sort of a bag of uh, Legos, telework report server is the completed project. So rather than asking you to build an application with our components, we are delivering a completed application to you in form of an installer that will install directly to your hosting environment um, and allow you to, as you said, Sam, it's a turnkey solution. I've set up a, a full production report server instance in under 30, 30 minutes, and that's with you know full um, redundant database connection. So it really is a turnkey solution to immediately get a reporting platform online and start getting it set up and, and ready to, to bring to market. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and it's one thing to be able to kind of um, get to your data uh, with your reporting solution, be able to build your data, but then the management and delivery and automation of reports is it's a whole other mindset and it takes a, a whole lot of other efforts. So this is our uh, pitch to kind of make this easy for you. So you have everything ready out of the box. Uh, so that's reporting and report server. They kind of work hand, uh, hand in hand. But Telerik reporting has a bunch of new things uh, this release. Um, and I'm excited about this like, as a .NET developer because I see um, latest platform support come up. Uh, so Blazor is, is hot and uh, obviously .NET developers are excited about it because you get to write C Sharp front and back. Um, so we have uh, two uh, brand new templates uh, that come with the installer and uh, looks like they are um, like they can either be for the report viewer uh, if you're just delivering your reports to a Blazor application or a full blown report designer if that's what you want to do on a web based report uh, server. And then uh, we can be sensitive as to whether you're running uh, Blazor server side or fully client side with WebAssembly. Um, um, so, Rick, uh, I know you, you're you excited about this and uh, you want to talk more about this, maybe in your demos? Yes, I would definitely love to show this off because this is a feature that I use all the time. Uh, it's definitely an easy button for setting up reporting. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I mean, some of this stuff can be done manually, but like the templates is just like a few clicks and you, and you have a report ready uh, connected to your data source. It's just so easy. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. And um, if you're on Windows, um, there are lots of different desktop technologies. Uh, like there is WPF, which we have had forever. Uh, there is WinForms and, and uh, UWP. But WinUI, uh, in particular WinUI 3, is the latest uh, Windows desktop stack. It's a full uh, UX framework uh, that runs on both .NET native, uh, uh, UWP, and uh, uh, kind of Win32 desktop applications. So it is fluent uh, design inspired and it's it's the latest Windows stack and um, we now have a brand new WinUI report viewer right uh, Rick and and this is kind of uh, kind of borrowing from what we have learned from the WPF viewer which we, again we have had for some time um, but um, and again WinUI 3 is being worked on this is not done yet in terms of Microsoft and uh, their uh, roadmap and timeline so this is still a preview so uh, we also have to kind of wait a little bit on some of the framework pieces to catch up, but there's a brand new uh, WinUI report viewer. If you're building like Greenfield modern um, desktop applications on Windows, uh, I would recommend you go with WinUI 3 and you have a report viewer that can deliver uh, Telerik reports uh, to WinUI 3. All right, and uh, moving on to the web report designer. Like Rick said, um, you can actually do much of the design reporting um, or <laughs> report designing uh, on the web, which is amazing, uh, that you can kind of replicate uh, desktop functionality so easily on the web nowadays. Um, so uh, Rick, do you want to talk about uh, how you have seen this evolve in the last uh, couple of years? Absolutely. So, I mean, I am constantly astonished by what the engineering team has done with the, the web report designer and how rapidly it is becoming just as good as the the platform designer, the, um, the Windows-based platform designer. I would never have imagined the features that they've brought online in such a short time. And I can see this, you know, down the line being, if not better than um, what's available in an installed application, just because of the, the flexibility that you can use to set it up and the ease of integration. Um, since the designer is in the exact same place as the rendering engine and the viewer in most applications, there's so little that you need to synchronize with the platform designer um, that you would get your report as a file, 
but now you have to design a methodology, a workflow for taking that file and integrating it into your application. And you know that could be anything from emailing it to an architect who who is going to manually drop it into a folder through um, something as complicated as designing an upload and validation process for these files. With the web-based designer, you really have the scope very drilled into your exact application, and you can easily sort of integrate this end-to-end -end life cycle in your in your um, application. And as it stands right now, I believe there is almost perfect feature parity between mm -hmm. the, the web report designer and the standalone report designer. And pretty much everything we do now are just productivity enhancements, uh, more wizards, more more um, uh, drag and drop features, uh, more context menus, just to make it even easier. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And like Rick and me are a little old school, like we don't mind a desktop application where we can design our reports, but like think about your users who don't need to install anything. They can just do it as a part of a web application that you're serving up. So it's been incredible to see the web report designer kind of catch up to the desktop counterparts uh, so quickly. So uh, this release, we have a couple of new things. Um, there is a brand new object data source wizard, so you can pull in um, kind of report data from other business objects from uh, other assemblies. And there is a new file dialog for you to kind of quickly, like what Rick said, like if you have a report definition file to be able to quickly upload, download that, work with it and save it off to your backend services if you need to. And we're actually dog footing a lot of our stuff as well. Some of this is actually built with uh, Kendi UI. So uh, we're excited about that. All right, so moving on um, to some of the other things, and uh, Rick, I know you, you were excited about some of this, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, there is a new way of keeping the client sessions alive, uh, especially when you're connected to uh, a remote uh, reporting REST service. Uh, we have a few new prompts, lots of bug fixes, lots of love everywhere. Uh, and, and I mean, this is what's incredible to me, that uh, we can run on the latest and greatest. Like yesterday, we talked about some of the desktop stuff, like WPF and WinForms running on .NET 6. And here we have a reporting solution that runs everywhere from like framework to .NET Core, 3.1, 5, and then all the way over to .NET 6. And we are not even there with .NET 6 yet. Uh, we're still on the RC release bits, uh, but we have support for .NET 6. If, if you want to live on the bleeding edge, uh, we are right there with you. All right, so Absolutely. Rick, I know we have talked for quite some time. Uh, let's get to the real expert showing off uh, the real things uh, for you. So Rick, I'm gonna change presenter real quickly to you. This is the fun part. Yep, and you have the floor. Okay, so let me share my screen. And if you can just let me know when you can see that, Sam, we'll get started. Yes, yes. Okay, so what I kind of did ahead of time is I built out a quick Blazor application and embedded our reporting components in it. Um, if uh, we have time at the end, I'll actually recreate this live just to show how easy the item templates are with this setup, but I wanted to make sure we could really show the features first. So let me go ahead and run this application. What I have here is an embedded report, um, embedded report engine with a front end Blazor report viewer and an integrated Blazor um, web report designer. And let's see, which window did that open on? Oh, here it is. Too many monitors, too little time. Okay, let me relaunch that. I never figured out why, but with Visual Studio, when I move an application from one monitor to another, it tends to get a little confused. Okay, so we have a Blazor application here. So I think what I'm gonna do is jump right into the report designer and show off some of these new features that, that we were talking about. So of course we have the web-based report designer here with one of our sample reports and a couple items, which I meant to delete ahead of time. Um, and you can see from the start menu, you have the ability to create new reports, open existing reports, so I'm just gonna create a new report real quick. And I wanna show off the new object data source. So the way this works is really cool. So behind the scenes in the Blazor application, you can subscribe to certain objects. And of course, as you know, one of the big benefits of Blazor is the ability to use your existing, um, your existing uh, code libraries in your application. So I actually have two libraries that I brought in. Let me go back to my code view just for one second. Um, one of my libraries is a, is linked in externally, 
um, this car object uh, library, which is built in, uh, which is a separate project and is linked in via the app settings. You can see that here. And I also am and self-linking uh, the report assemblies back to this to the actual Blazor project itself. So what that basically means is I am getting access to all of my public data methods that I've created in this pro in, in this project without having an external project. So really, what I'm trying to show here is no matter which no matter where your your data libraries reside, whether it's an external um, product um, or an internal um, class, you can access them with the new business object um, uh, object data source. So I'm going to start with an internal library. I think a lot of people are familiar with my world famous Duck Stooge data source. Um, so you can select that and click next and it'll ask you to select from a either the default constructor or choose a constructor i for this one uh, intentionally created a separate public um, getter method uh, or get data and what we have here is a really cool live preview of of that data source so i mean when you think about it what's really happening behind the scenes is that the report viewer knows enough to initialize uh, that object in order to make a call to that method and get some rows of data in order to even show you this because these are all hard coded so there's nothing that was already in memory for this so it's doing a lot of work actually behind the scenes to even bring you this nice preview and you can just hit finish and like we've always had in the um, in the web designer you now have your data source with your fields and you can just quickly drag some fields over here and go to preview and I forgot to do the thing I always forget to do, and that is to actually associate that data source with my report. Okay, now let's go to preview. And you get a very basic report, um, but tons of actual work hard behind the scenes to, to make sort of that workflow as easy as it was for me to do in, in a couple of seconds. And just as similarly, you can edit that data source. And if you wanted to pick a different object, this one is actually, like I mentioned, external to this entire project. It's just the assemblies linked in at runtime. So here you would use the default constructor and get a different set of data. So now these fields have no meaning. So we'll just go ahead and get rid of those. And we could bring in, for example, the model, the manufacturer, uh, the year. And I think we actually have image data in this one. So oops, I don't want a text box for an image. What I want is a picture box. So let's grab a picture box and we will put it here. And these are these are quick and dirty reports, but um, we can just go ahead and associate the image URL with that. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Not bad. You got, got so, fancy with your cars. <laughs> I don't know. Your your, your Duck Stooge uh, is still pretty world well famous. Like folks were uh, asking for uh, your demos and your service uh, in in the past. But this is also fancy. <laughs> I'm gonna well, if you think those are great, I'm gonna show off a little in a few minutes something that one of my colleagues built, and it is mind-boggling what she was able to do with teleporting. So there's a little teaser for you. Um, Actually, let's, let's show that off right now. Uh, so that was the, the object data source, which amazingly powerful. I mean, a lot of people have business objects that they want to use, especially in Blazor, and just the ease that which you can link those now into your reporting and start building out reports you know, quickly. There was very little I did behind the scenes to stage this. I mean, you're seeing all the work being done more or less live. So, so let's say- I had a quick Quick question, Rick. So the, the cars thing that you showed, like, is that a separate mm -hmm. DLL that you have, or uh, is that coming from a separate project? Yeah, let me let me just show that in Visual Studio real quick, just to make it clear. Um, so there's a car object project which just has a um, a public. Oh, here, here's a new feature that we added. Um, it is complaining that I tried to leave the page without saving my my report. So yes, you may leave. Um, that's not another new feature but uh so yeah so it's just a static method um and this is an external dll and you can see that it's the dependency is linked into the um into the project here because it's in the same project uh in the same solution excuse me and if it was outside of the solution you could just link in the assembly uh, anything dot dll and it would still as long as you go into your app settings in json and 
set the name of that object for your dependency injection and reflection um, to, to figure it out, it will uh, find those, those methods. And this is security more than anything else. Make sure that only the objects you want to be exposed to your reporting surface are going to be exposed to the users. Otherwise, you can have you know anything that was available in the application would be popping up in there, and you may not want that. Makes sense. So let's see. Let me launch this one more time. So my colleague uh, Nelly on the support engineering team built an amazing um, report as part of a blog series, and I'm just blown away. So I was going to try and build my own. Um, I think we talked about Sam. I was going to try and build my own little game for for today's webinar, but I could never do justice to to this. So we show so. I have this report external to the application right now. It hasn't been incorporated at all, sitting in a folder. So what I want to do is upload it. I'm going to click the upload button, select file, and let's see. I need to find the report. And let's see, what did I put it? Did I put it in the webinar? Ah, yes, I did. Okay. So here's my report, TRDX, Telework Reporting uh, Definition uh, XML. Click upload. Upload succeeded, click open, and we get a report in uh, the report designer, pretty simple. Now let's go to preview. And through the incredible flexibility of the reporting engine and the, the vastness of the expression library, uh, we actually have a fully functional tic-tac-toe game built into a reporting solution. So uh, I will take... I'll take this top corner here. Um, do you want to pick a spot, Sam? Uh, let's do the middle for me. Middle. Okay. I'm going to go over here. Okay, Sam? Uh -oh. All right. Well, I'll take the one at the bottom because I can't see your lines anyways. Bottom. Okay. Yeah. So, uh-oh. So, I'm going to take this one yeah. here and I win. <laughs> this is incredible. This is in a report. It is. It's a, it's a report, but I mean, it's a it's a full game. Um, normally, these parameters on the side here would be hidden, but I turned them on because they're they're so cool in in just the ingenuity of how this was set up. I mean, so using report parameters, um, the the entire state of the game is being maintained in one string, and every time you click on an item here, we're using something called a report action. And what it's doing is updating this parameter um, collection and then going back into the same report with different parameters. So all of the logic is in the expression engine behind the scenes using these parameters as sort of a stateful management. And I never even thought about doing something like this before, but it's totally possible with how flexible the, the reporting engine is and the report design surface, um, especially with the expression syntax. Nothing in, no code at all. And no actual like C sharp or code or anything is being used to do this. No, oh, that's incredible. All right. Okay. And um, if you wanted to get started on this, like from scratch, like uh, could you show us the templates? The yes, for the um, the Blazor templates. Yeah. Okay. So to do that, let me close this, and I'm going to stop this project. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new Blazor application. File new. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to do a Blazor server app. This fully works for WebAssembly too, but um, as people who work with WebAssembly apps know, you end up with three projects in the solution for hosted, um, and all the pieces end up going into different projects. So uh, just for the sake of simplicity, let's build this using a, um, a uh, Blazor server app. Normally, I do this demo with .NET 6. You've seen, we've seen this before when I did this webinar um, last release. I always do these demos in .NET 6 to show that it's fully possible. There is currently an issue in Project Reunion, a minor issue, where if .NET 6 is installed um, in the preview mode, you end up getting issues with WinUI um, in the in the latest stable branch. I think it's been fixed in the experimental branch. Anyway, long story short, I had to uninstall .NET 6 uh, in order to do my UI demo. 
So that's why I'm. Yeah, and sometimes you forget stuff. like everything. All of this stuff is in preview. Like this is all yeah. being worked on. Like uh, VS 2022 and .NET 6 and mm -hmm. and the Win UI, like how the apps are packaging or uh, how they're being packaged and and the .NET MAUI dependencies. It's all preview bits here. Yeah. So yeah, that was one where we ended up at an intersection of two things that just weren't going to work together. Um, Okay, so I have basically a blank canvas here. This is just a Blazor application. So if I wanted to add reporting to this, it's really quite simple. All you do is right click, select add new item, and you have your templates here. Let's just search for report. And you have to put a couple of templates in here. So we want the this is a we want the, the two Blazor templates. We have some HTML JavaScript ones as well. That's new. So we have your report designer and your report reviewer. So we'll just add a designer real quick. It'll ask me to rebuild the project. Okay, now here's where you can use a REST service. Um, that's the embedded report engine like we were using before. Um, or you could point it to uh, an existing REST service if you have one already, already created somewhere. For this, I'll just use a new one. And we'll click Next. We use a sample report definition and finish. Behind the scenes, it's going to NuGet. It's bringing in all of the all the assemblies needed, all of the uh, dependencies. It's adding these uh, scripts and styles that are needed. Um, and well, I mean, here's a full list of everything that it does for you um, in a couple of seconds. And what you end up with is this report designer page uh, here. And this is a fully registered um, and um, configured report designer. So if you wanted to load this, all you would have to do is navigate to this page here, which I'll go ahead and just run this app really quickly. Okay, we get the default Hello World program and we are going to go to our new page. And this is the same report design that we were looking at before in the application that I had set up ahead of time. Okay, this is incredible, right? Because like you literally started from a bland like Acer project and just like drop in one uh, template and uh, you have a report design, not just the viewer, you have a full blown report designer with the REST service uh, built in for you. I counted four mouse clicks and nothing to type. Yeah, that's incredible. You can follow pretty much the exact same process to add a report viewer. You would just select um, add new item. You would find your, your report viewer. Oh, here it is here. And let's see. So same. The only difference here is you can take this and you can point it to a report server as the data source. So I actually have a report server that's set up in my environment. So let's see if I want to do that. And let's point it to some credentials. And it's actually going to check that, um, yeah, it's going to check that connection directly in the wizard to make sure you didn't mistype something. Um, so you, now you have some confidence that you have the correct information. And again, one click for next, select the default report. So what it's doing is it's looking to my reports server and finding all of my reports that I have up there. Um, so I can pick any of these reports that I want and hit next, enable accessibility if you like, um, and hit finish. Same thing, adds all the NuGet packages that's needed, all the dependencies, all of the, all of the scripts, creates the razor, and you end up with report viewer page here, which has everything built into it, the service URLs and um, the starting, uh, starting report. So it's really, Amazingly very, simple very nice. to get yeah. up and run. All I really did with the um, with the one that I bootstrapped was to add some um, add some items into the menu bar for navigation and uh, some styling and some text changes uh, and a little bit of cleanup. Oh, and I built the the object method ahead of time for the cars. But as far as the heavy lifting of setting up the the report, the actual reporting elements in the application, that was the easiest thing that I did. <laughs> I had yeah. So just in, in in a few steps, like you showed us the template, you showed us the new 
uh, like the file dialogs, uh, you showed us the new prompts, like if you are trying to leave the uh, report uh, without saving it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed with just how little it takes to get these things going. I have two more items on my checklist. So um, one I'm just gonna talk about, that's the Keep Alive feature. There's a new property you can add to your report viewer called Keep Alive, it's a simple Boolean. And what that does is behind the scenes, it will keep the user session active for as long as the user is interacting with the report viewer. So for in situations where a user is going to be interacting with a report quite a bit, like our tic-tac-toe game, um, you might want to keep that session alive um, for efficiency rather than opening and closing sessions um, every time they, they perform an action. So in that case, you would you know, set that report viewer for keep alive. In other situations where you have long running reports and there's not going to be any interactivity, it's going to be basically just run and then exported and then um, it's done, you would want to turn that off um, because you want to close that user session as soon as that report is done and free up server resources for, for the next user. So uh, now we have the ability to really fine tune your application and make sure you're using the correct memory allocations for this, your individual situation. And one more thing to show, close this. I had a lot of fun building this. Um, I always like playing with new frameworks and it seems like as soon as there's a new framework available, the reporting team has a report viewer for it. Sometimes even before I know that a framework is available as a release candidate. Yep. So what we have here is a WinUI 3. Um, uh, uh, it's the the Win App SDK, formerly known as Product Reunion um, uh, Library. So, and a report viewer built on top of that. I think you mentioned Sam. This is basically inherited from um, our WPF report viewer, with some changes made. Um, but the fact that it just works so simply out of the box, and I think if I'm not lying. Yes, this one is actually connected dynamically to my running report server, which is running um, uh, in the background on my system. So really, yeah. on, on even something as new as WinUI, we already have these full integrations between the, the report server, the front-end UI, the web-based report designer, and that all just comes down to, to the architects of reporting and how how regularized they've made the APIs and how standards based they made sure everything was. Just the, the fact that something can come out and just immediately work this seamlessly. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, here you have it folks. Like if you want to stay on the bleeding edge, like Blazor is ready for production, but if you want to do WinUI that's not quite ready yet, uh, we, are, we are already there uh, <clears throat> trying to help you out. So uh, folks in the Q&A panel are impressed with your demos, uh, Rick, as always. Um, but I did want to bring up like one question, uh, which has, I think, already been answered by uh, our teams here. But David Thornton uh, was asking about like report versioning. Uh, and I wanted to like pick your brains. Like, how do you version your reports between versions that it's been built on and, and edited? So you mean uh, the version of the report itself um, that you're designing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you're using the telecreporting SDK, um, that is entirely up to you to decide how you would like to version your reports. They are um, XML at the core, easily serializable, so you can link in any type of versioning system that you want to, to manage that for you, um, with, whether it be t um, uh, uh, team, uh, not teams, um, uh, TFS or, um, or some type of Git repository. You could really use anything you like to manage the versioning of your report, either manually or automatically. With um, Telic Report Server, which let me just, I think I have mine up and already. Yeah, let me bring this over here. So as I mentioned, since Telic Report Server is something that we kind of build for you, you know, from scratch, we built versioning into this already. So you can see my dashboard report here is one that I play with quite a bit. On the side, you can look and see all the different versions of this report that I have uh, saved over time. Uh, you can say you can see who saved it, the date that they saved it, if you want to, you can actually go back and preview any of the old versions and kind of do like an A-B roll between them. And if someone were to make some mistakes or, or mess up the report, you can go back to any version that you like and revert to that version easily. So that's a, a, a pre-canned feature in Report Server. In the reporting SDK, you are, you are free to manage that, you know, however you like. You can do no versioning, full, full overwrite replacement, or you can version every single change. 
All right. So yeah, hopefully, David, that that answers your question. But if you're still in doubt, like please please reach out to us, uh, support systems, and uh, let let us help. All right. So Rick, anything else? Uh, that was it for what I wanted to show. So yeah, unless there are more questions, I can let you move on to your next presenter. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. You know, I know Rick, you can talk about reporting all day long and we are uh, we really are like standing on the shoulder of giants with our engineering teams who do such amazing work on reporting. Uh, so let's uh, let's actually switch gears here and um, I'm gonna take the control back for a second and we do have a little bit of interactivity for you all to kind of um, chime in. So uh, it's time for a quick poll question. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you are uh, looking to, uh, or if you have played around with the report uh, designer, um, how has been your experience? Because like we are pouring in a lot of engineering, a lot of innovation on this. So we just want to know uh, how's been your, your experience. So please tell us. I see the numbers uh, going up, which is um, kind of what you expect. Like the folks who have used it uh, uh, have found it to be very easy, and that's good to know. Uh, but a lot of folks have actually not used it. So this is an opportunity for you folks. Uh, if you are using reporting, like you have this uh, as a part of your solution. So uh, consider exposing the report uh, designing aspect of it through your web application to your users. So they don't have to install anything and you can give them admin and different types of rights and uh, they can be up and about uh, designing their own reports. All right, folks, that's it with the uh, with the poll going once, going twice, and yep, yeah, there you see the results. So for the folks who haven't used it, please, please try it. Uh, I, I guarantee you're going to be impressed. All right, so um, let's move on. <clears throat> and let's see if I can find my mouse pointer. All right, it's fiddle time, it's fiddle time. All right, so uh, thank you so much, Rick. And I'm gonna ask uh, Eve here to come back on. And yeah, it's fiddle time. You know, every time uh, we, we do webinars in the past where we haven't given enough time to Fiddler, people are like, that's the thing I use the most. Uh, so we're just so glad to be able to talk about Fiddler. And uh, the Fiddler story has evolved so much, uh, Eve, and, and you and, and the team has worked so much on this. Uh, are you excited with uh, where Fiddler is right now and where it's going? Yes, I'm beyond excited. There has been so much that's happened within the last six months, and there's so much planned for the next year. Uh, we have a lot to share, and there are other things forthcoming, but uh, the feedback has been really impressive, and the amount of time and dedicated effort the team is putting forth um, is really showing in the product. Absolutely. And I like, like this so saying, many... I might keep this. Yeah. It's Fiddler time. I like that. Yeah. And, and like so many developers, like we have kind of grown up in our ranks, like using Fiddler uh, kind of for a variety of applications. So it's, it's good to see the whole portfolio kind of grow and uh, see what it evolves into. So um, folks, if you are um, new, brand new to Fiddler, if you do a search, you likely end up on this page and you'll see a couple of different uh, types of Fiddler. Or if you have used Fiddler forever, on Windows, keep on doing what you have doing. Uh, but I'll let um, Eve here uh, to kind of walk us through a little bit as to where the Fiddler portfolio stands right now, because it's not one thing, it's actually a family of products. So Eve, do you want to talk, through, talk us through this? Sure. So as Sam mentioned, you know, the Fiddler is now a family of products. You know, it's no longer your Windows only debugging tool. We now have a cross-platform version, which is Fiddler Everywhere, works on Mac and Linux. We also have Fiddler Jam and Fiddler Cap, which are more troubleshooting uh, tools. And then we also have Fiddler Core, which is that embeddable.net engine. Uh, so depending on your use case and your needs, there's a Fiddler you know, that's right for you. And that's what that page really helps people navigate to. Uh, before, I think there was maybe some confusion, but now we've made it clear, you know, tell us what you want to do, what type of system you're working on, and we can point you in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been a Fiddler classic Windows user for a long time, but my dev machine, like I live in the cross-platform world, it's Mac, because I also run Windows as well as a VM. I love Fiddler everywhere because I can literally just run it everywhere. 
and uh, yeah, it, the, the, it's, it's just completely written from ground up. The UX is amazing, so uh, I loved it. But uh, you are actually more excited about Fiddler Jam these days, because I hear uh, we just had a big release, right? So tell us about Fiddler Jam. Sure, it's kind of like having two children, right? You can't say one is your favorite, but sometimes one is just really killing it right now, and you, you know, we want to talk about um, what's sure. going on with that. And that's what it is with Fiddler Jam right now. We released yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. We moved out of beta to RTW, and with that um, jump, we also debuted some new features. So just some of us who may have attended this before, I'll give a quick overview. So Fiddler Jam is a remote troubleshooting solution for customer support teams that are supporting end users. So it gives them a Chrome extension that the end users can use as well as a portal for the support and development teams to use to really get in and determine what is going on with a bug. You know, and the ultimate goal is to capture it with all of the context, don't miss any details. And we know with these support teams, they have high expectations. So they need to, you know, close these tickets faster and get to done and move on. And so that's what Fielder Jam does, is it gives you that end-to-end -end unified tool chain. Um, and as you have here, you know, the end user support team and development team, and it expands um, unlike anything um, alternatively. Yeah, I, I love this because like, it's just so difficult for support teams to kind of get the hang of what exactly the user might have been doing. And now you have full visibility and you, you I'm sure you'll talk about some of the things that are just brand new in this release. Um, but I also like how it's like, uh, it's like a tiered uh, thing. So you have, uh, the support team and then for the things that you really need to be like dug deep into you can forward that to the dev teams with full visibility and then the entire stack so let's uh, let's kind of go into what's new because I know uh, there are a lot of exciting things so first thing is we have a brand new capture video functionality right yes. so uh, yes. let's talk us through this this is a big one um, prior to this release we did have the screen capture but with the release that happened yesterday, we have this screen recording capability. And as you have here, so you can, in, in three steps, you hit start capture, video is enabled by default. Um, you capture the screen that you're looking on, whichever browser instance or tab that you opened, and then you hit stop and it generates a log of every interaction um, in any type of activity element that happened during that recording. So we've all been in that yeah. situation where, well, did this on my machine? The support person says, well, did you hit enter? No, I didn't hit right. enter. Yeah. Well, then you get, the, you get the recording be like, yeah, well, there's a lot you didn't share, right? And there's right. no more right. of that back and forth. I mean, there's no question of exactly what happened within that log file. Yeah, so um, I want to get to the other stuff, like what user events we are capturing. But uh, like, uh, remind me to ask you about the synchronization, because I, I love this, because you have full visibility on exactly what the user is doing and what that triggered. Um, so let's uh, let's have you talk through the next thing here, which is uh, capturing all of the user events, right? So this is exactly what the user is doing while yes. on screen, while they're using our application, right? Right, so this is also that comes along with the video recording, as well as with the screen capturing, we have all of these um, event elements that you're now able to track. So uh, some of them that you have listed here, like click, double click, they navigated to, and some of these like double click is really important if your logic, you know, um, needs to be evaluated based on certain actions. Um, others, you just need to understand the steps so you can maybe reproduce it. So it gives you a couple different avenues, which I find really intriguing and intuitive. Yeah, so the, the, the event capture and the video are kind of in sync, right? So I can kind of click around and when I look at an event, I can also see what the user was actually looking at or doing. At yes. that point of time? Yes. Um, you, you're literally kind of putting yourself in the shoes of the user like, and, and seeing it through their eyes and, and trying to exactly see what they were doing. I like how you say that, yes. Yeah. See it through yeah. their eyes. Right. Exactly. All right, but you have uh, a lot more here. Uh, looks like yeah, there are things about storage details uh, and uh, what settings the user was using uh, in their uh, extension while Fiddler Jam was capturing. So uh, can you tell us more? Yeah, so once you go into the Fiddler Jam portal, there's a filter and you can search by all or you can go through these individually, um, whether it be, you know, the size or the different activities. But then on the other side 
of the screen, you can, there's an inspectors tab. And on that inspectors tab is where you're going to find a lot of this information that you have on here. So it's going to give you storage details, it's going to give you date and times, it's going to tell you whether it's any kind of ID data, um, server to client side, direction of scrolls. I mean, there's so many things in there that I don't think you're going to be left wondering, well, I wish I had this because it's yeah. all there. And you, you take what yeah. you want from it, right? I mean, exactly. we're giving you everything. You can figure out what's important to you and in your situation. Right. So when we are um, using the Fiddler Gem extension, we are recording everything and then it gets saved and you generate a link. And is that what I open up in the Fiddler Gem portal? Yes. So once you download the extension right from the Chrome store, so um, really easy to do. There's no security firewalls, you know, you need to worry about. Um, and then you can manage it from the extension manager. But when you open that up and you go through those three steps, it gives you a link. And then you would send this, if I was the end user and you were my you know, support person, I would send you this link. You would click on the link and you would open it up within the Fiddler Jam portal. And that's kind of like your workstation. Nice. And like along with all of this like extreme visibility, like I, I'm also glad that the team is thinking about uh, the sensitivity of the data that we're capturing. Like we, we don't want to see what we don't want to see, right? Right. So you have you have uh, settings which can kind of mask any type of sensitive data that the user is entering. Yeah, what's neat about this is that built in within Fiddler Jam, the team has tried to automatically mask sensitive data that's in certain um, formats. So like JSON, XML, XForm, URL encoded, those type of things are, you know, attempted to be automatically removed. So you don't have to think about that. We understand those and have built that into it. Absolutely. All right. So, like, enough talk uh, seems like I, I want to see this. I want to see the portal. I want to see all of this in action. So, you, if you don't mind, I am going to give the floor to you and have you show us. No problem. All right. You should be up. Okay. Let me know if you can see yes. the portal. We do. We do. Okay. So this is a Fiddler Jam portal, and for time purposes, I created a sample log ahead of time. So this is a sample log based on the to-do list. You've all seen that before, so it's very familiar. And what we did here is created um, a replicate of what it would happen if someone had you know, gone through all the steps and recorded all these actions. So what I want to start here is you can tell by this icon right at the top left that this is a video recording. Because remember, as I mentioned, you can do screen captures or videos, um, and that will give you that indicator right off the bat. And then you can see all of the captured events here. And what's nice is they're actually sequenced. I like that. So you have the 1 through uh, 41 in this particular. And this helps when that collaboration needs to occur. So if I said, hey, Sam, can you look at this log on line 7? Right, you can easily find that. So we don't have to do all the searching and an added bonus here this link would allow you to export the log into fiddler everywhere if we have time i'll show you that but that sequence number stays with it so it doesn't move so no matter if you're working inside fiddler everywhere or fiddler jam you know exactly where you need to be um, and here's a screen recording we were talking about a little bit sam so you see we hit play and as we go through the elements you can see this indicator here is moving alongside See how it's going down based yeah, on nice, the timestamp. Nice. So I think that's really important. So you always know exactly where you need to be and at what moments. Um, and then also, what do you have here? This is the inspectors tab that I was talking about. So this is where you're going to get your all your headers, your parameters. You get the request, the response, as I mentioned, the time. Um, you know, there's so many different things that you can do within here, the cookies. and this is that event uh, event type tracking we were talking about. So if I wanted to, let's say, just do clicks. Oh, it's, okay. it's good that I can I can filter, so like I can focus on like just what I want to know. Yes. And so here you can click, and again, you have the indicator that there's a screenshot, and it shows you specifically here um, of what you do. It also tells you whether or not there's a double click. It also gives you IDs if applicable. You know, and then what was um, what the input was on this particular tag. 
So, I mean, it just gives you so much, like. What, what is in the, uh, in the storage details uh, tab next to the captured logs? Let's see. No, like r right to the left of the captured logs. Oh, right here. Yeah. Okay, okay. so this is gonna show you that local storage or that session storage. It gives you the key and then the value. I see. Yeah. Okay. Right, and um, you said like, um, I, I see the big uh, add to workspace, like is that what takes it uh, all the way into Fiddler Everywhere? So what I would do here, it's pretty simple. You hit this. Oh, okay. You hit proceed. I have sure. Fiddler Everywhere, you know, I'm already have my account. If you did not have that, you would have to just quickly enter a few bits yep. of information. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so I'm going to it up. And I'm, I'm guessing it'll like bring bring the context right in with it. Yep. I mean, it is. Watch this. I got my, and it says. Yep. There it is. It's there. all mm -hmm. there. And there's nothing that you need to do to retrofit this. It all fits right in. You get all the full capabilities of Fiddler everywhere using your Fiddler Jam. Um, logo right from or log right from this the desktop app that's amazing this is a big release for fitness yes. this is so exciting to see you know um, and these are some of those new things that we talked about in a few um webinars ago but you know we have new rules and inspector tabs and overviews and you can see all of your logs and sessions and other people can share them with you yeah, um yeah. so yeah that's been it's pretty amazing it is all right, anything else you want to show? Because uh, there are a couple of questions that maybe we can dive into. Sure. Um, no, I mean, I can go through some of these more, but otherwise I think they're pretty um, pretty self-explanatory. You know, That's here it, it talks be, right? about transition yeah. types and gives you URLs, uh, but it just there's so much you can do within here. It's fun just to kind of play around. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, in the Q&A panel, David Thornton yes. was asking if, and, and I think like I've actually asked you this question multiple times, like on streams or webinars, uh, but is, is it Chrome only, uh, the extension? Yes. Okay. But uh, like eventually, like, I mean, it's, it's working on Chromium, so eventually you can think of this being supported outside of Chrome as well. I could see that happening. You know, right now we have to see, you know, what, what the market need is for that. Um, but right now it seems to be, uh, we seem to be where we need to be. Yeah. Uh, right. Aaron Peters was asking if um, if we have any um, knowledge of whether this capturing is going to slow down the user's workstation by any means. Are there any like, minimum requirements uh, for doing this? I haven't run across that. I mean, browser extensions by nature are pretty lightweight. Yeah, that's true. You know, and you're, you're, yeah. there's no native software that they need to install. So I, I don't think you're going to run into that as you would with um other type of tooling like a, full feature, like a desktop software yes. right. right i mean uh like at the end of the day like a tab is a chrome process like it's, it's a thread and extensions may or may not uh, spin up their own threads uh, but that's all up to chrome to manage and you're all still within the browser sandbox so i, I don't envision any 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 performance issues here yeah and the early adopters we have had um haven't reported anything along those lines and they've actually said by having it as the uh, portal extension, they can overcome any of those traditional IT barriers that they would have, like in educational settings or financial settings um, because of the format that we have. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, in the Q&A panel, like, uh, I see questions that can get very complicated on, on, on some of the nuances of this, like um, where exactly does your web application need to be opened up in terms of like if you're behind like firewalls and opening up your server to like NAT or the internet. So those are like very specific questions like Steve and other folks who are asking. So please tell us a little bit more and uh, we have our support folks in the background so they can uh, they can try to help you out. But at the end of the day, if you can have your users install uh, an extension from Chrome, you are golden. That That's all you need to do uh, to have all of this capture, right? And, and the user gets to uh, also choose, like if, if you can uh, Eve, just show me the Chrome extension one time and like some of the sens uh, like the sensitivity settings that you have. Yep. Let me pull up. Oops. Okay, let me just go to this. So see here, I have the icon right here. 
So I'll click on this and this is the extension. Um, it's three steps like we talked about. These are the advanced options. You can see capture video is on by default. You can yep. you know, easily toggle on and off depending on your preferences and um, close that. And then what you do is you hit start capture, go through. No, but but right, right in there, you like you saw options about like cookies and sensitive data and, and yes. screencast and, and, and the video. So you get full flexibility as a user, what you want to be captured or not. 100%. You're right. And then we also have this password protection that you can decide yes. to do. So if you need that extra layer of security um, that is available to you. And we do have, you know, just the reminders. You know, these aren't to be warning messages, but just a friendly reminder as you're capturing stuff, um, you know, just in your sharing logs, just be cognizant, you know, be mindful of, of what you're sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and uh, in the Q&A panel, Michael Spiro, like, uh, there, there are questions about licensing, like how you can distribute this to the users. Yeah, that's exactly the thing that our uh, our PMs and support folks are here to answer. So, um, yeah, please uh, look around. Uh, this is brand new uh, in terms of just the release coming out. Uh, I think this was like this week, right, uh, Eve? Yeah, yesterday. Like, literally okay. hot off the All press. Right. Hot off I think the this press. is the second, like, um, heard it here first with you, Sam. All right, there really really uh hot bits here so uh, <laughs> take a look around folks we are super excited uh to kind of evolve uh the fiddler family like it's been there and it's done all of these things for developers for ages right your your network stack and your visibility but now we are seeing like you, it can actually do a lot more from a user standpoint and bringing that over uh in a stacked way through the support teams and uh, back to your dev teams um, so you're never um, ever in doubt as to what the user might have been doing uh, while they had uh, an error. So um, if you have um, like network or um, uh, user errors that you want to uh, dive into, like this is the solution uh, to do so. Yeah, and what's nice about this solution is that we talked about the two different parts, but you're able to give your end users a better support experience, right? Which in the long run helps your support team um, meet their KPIs and their um, expectations and we know that everything's becoming more customer centric right um, the support teams are no longer being considered a cost center like they're becoming an integral part of your um, retention and your business and so Absolutely. this is something that that you're going to need um, otherwise you're going to get passed by yeah absolutely well said well said all right, so uh, yeah, a few more questions here in the chat room. Please uh, keep them coming. And um, Eve, if there is nothing else you wanted to show, uh, I can take control back. I mean, I could talk uh, about Fiddler all day, but uh, I know you can. I, mean, I know there's I know much more can. to show. Rick yeah. did a great job with reporting. His team does not disappoint, so um, I'm happy to pass the baton. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eve. And um, actually, we uh, before we let you go, Eve, we do have a, a quick poll question here, um, kind of in um, in line with uh, how Fiddler Everywhere is going and uh, where we want to see that evolve. So how are you doing uh, performance and security testing today? So take a minute and uh, tell us how you're doing it right now. But no, this is so key. Uh, like, are you bringing folks in? Uh, are you depending on external tools or would you rather uh, do it yourself? So it comes down to a lot of preferences and what the tools are actually doing for you. That also kind of dictates your decision. Yes. So we, yeah, we are hoping that uh, Fiddler Everywhere uh, can be positioned to do all of this uh, for you. So going once, going twice and done. Let's see the responses here. Okay, so this may be in line with what uh, maybe if you were expecting that uh, a lot of people are using external tools and yeah. uh, that's that's pricey, right? So uh, yeah, this is uh, this is perfect. And then again, a lot of people don't do the security and performance testing. We get that as well. Um, but uh, maybe it's time you take a look at um, uh, Fiddler Everywhere. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, the team uh, that kind of talks about how Fiddler Everywhere can be utilized by your dev teams, like uh, just for the performance optimizations of your web applications, the things you can slow down and kind of fine tune and um, see how those things work. And also the security considerations, like what happens to your cookies, what happens uh, within your HTTPS uh, bundles. So all of this is stuff we are thinking about 
and uh, we are we are hoping that uh, we have uh, products that help you um, find solutions uh, to those problems. All right, Eve, thank you so much. Thank you so okay. much uh, to you and thank the team you. for kind of keeping us uh, keeping us on our toes with Fiddler. So okay. this is amazing. All right. So long. Switching up gears here. Thank you for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's go. Oh, actually, uh, I'm still on the Fiddler uh, things here. Let's uh, switch up gears here to talk about Chessbook. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Misha here from our site uh, to come back on. There you are, Misha. So Misha is actually in uh, Sofia, mm -hmm. Bulgaria. So it's a late evening for you, Misha. Thank you for uh, kind of staying on with us. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, so no, let's go okay. full screen. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, JustMock here. This is exciting because uh, this is kind of close to my heart uh, as a developer. Uh, this is uh, our life every day, unit testing and mocking and, and trying to fake out the things we uh, can in our, uh, in our apps, in our code. Um, so this has come a long way, uh, JustMock. Um, Misha, I'm going to let you speak to what JustMock is uh, for a minute. For folks who might not have ever used it, uh, we, are, we are hoping most of you have. Uh, but uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about JustMock. Well, JustMock is a mocking framework uh, that is um, absolutely uh, marvelous and uh, it has uh, a lot, a lot of uh, features and um, uh, just one of the, the, the main, the main things that JustMock uh, can do is mock everything. Uh, by everything, I mean it can mock uh, static uh, methods and properties. It can mock uh, private methods, properties, members, and uh, you can mock everything literally. You can mock even uh, date time, uh, date time now uh, from the system library, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, why you need uh, just mock and why you could uh, why should you use it well in unit testing when you try to uh, to isolate your code you typically uh, depend uh, on uh, some stuff and that uh, you want to to isolate to isolate it uh, from and uh, sometimes that is uh, pretty hard to do like uh, if you uh, if your trial uh, mechanism is uh, depending on, let's say, uh, the time now, uh, you need to have a, a way to to unit test um, this code in isolation from that uh, the, the time now, and uh, you can do that with uh, just mock uh, by mocking uh, uh, that uh, property and uh, return a value that uh, you want uh, this way. Uh, your unit test uh, will be always uh, stable and you will focus uh, your efforts on actually thinking about uh, different scenarios where you should uh, uh, use unit testing and cover those scenarios with uh, unit testing uh, instead of uh, trying to figure out how to isolate the code that you want to test. Yeah. No, that that's well said, and and that is a big claim, and and I, I I like the fact that the team can back it up. Like when you say mock everything, like you, you are talking about like uh, kind of down to the nitty gritty, like the language details here about sealed Absolutely. classes and static methods, uh, and being able to mock everything out uh, is real nice. And and this is something a lot of like dev teams struggle with, right? So everybody want, has the right intentions. Like we all want to write unit tests, and we want to have. Um, a very high percentage of code coverage, but it's just not easy because you are trying to deliver business value. And every release, you are trying to add on more unit tests while you're adding code. Um, so we want solutions that work quickly and let the developers write the unit tests quickly. So I think this is where JustMock fits. Um, so let's uh, kind of dive into some of the new things um, that you and your team have put together. So uh, the debug window is kind of like the core of the JustMock experience. And it sounds like uh, you've added some notifications. So like I don't miss stuff like as my unit tests are being run or hit, uh, I have notifications that tell me uh, what's being uh, what's been done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is uh, the main uh, reason uh, we implemented the debug uh, window. When uh, when you have uh, an issue, let's say, with your mock object, uh, you can use the debug window to just uh, check uh, how uh, you have arranged uh, the particular method or property, uh, 
what invocations are triggered for uh, that uh, mock. And uh, if something is different, you can just uh, uh, find the, different, the difference in what you have arranged and what is actually happening. Nice, nice. Yeah, and, and uh, the new feature is actually adding notification that uh, a new invocation uh, ha has occurred. Uh, if you don't pay attention or if you are uh, you have clicked on the other tabs like argument matcher or the, the book trace. Right. And like for any product, like if you are starting up using it or if you want to kind of get into an advanced level, like it's all about the documentation, right? So if you are struggling with documentation, then we have not done our jobs, right? So um, Misha, it looks like the team has worked a lot on the documentation side this time. Yes, uh, we actually reworked uh, the whole uh, getting started uh, experience. Uh, yes. uh, all of the articles are reworked. Uh, and uh, in our documentation, we typically have uh, explanation about uh, what the feature and the, the feature actually do with uh, some very, very simple example. Uh, and for the getting started um, articles, uh, we decided to add uh, a real world example of uh, how just more can be used. So uh, I, I believe that uh, this is something that will be uh, very uh, useful to everybody who is uh, reading the documentation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna move on to uh, something that I just absolutely love, right? I mean, talk about being feature facing and then cross platform and living on the bleeding edge. So you got three big, big things that uh, the team put together for this release. So for the first yeah. time, Ever, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, we have always been on Windows, right? But for the first time, you have Linux yeah. support now. Yeah, That's we have awesome. uh, Linux support. Uh, uh, we put uh, a lot of efforts uh, uh, during the summer, and uh, we now support uh, Linux. And uh, this was uh, something that uh, many of our customers uh, were wanting for some time. And yeah, we we act on that uh, feedback we uh, that we received from them, and uh, we deliver the Linux support. Nice. So, like, if you can explain this to me a little bit, like, uh, what exactly, like, what type of apps are we talking about running on Linux, or are we talking about running the IDs on Linux? Well, there are uh, dif uh, different types of si uh, situations where you want to run your code on Linux, but uh, typically this that does not uh, involve uh, like developing on Linux. So uh, the support currently is uh, related, let's say, to continuous integration or uh, if you want to execute your code on Linux. Uh, right. It's not uh, meant currently to be like part of the development cycle on Linux. And uh, Which, I mean, like how, how, how yeah, many people so, like actually develop on Linux? That that's a very minor IT. But I mean, a lot of us use like containers, like Linux containers, to run our code. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that that is something that uh, we uh, we worked a lot, and uh, is something that uh, a lot of our customers uh, were wanting. Nice. And also, I really, really love this. Like, talk about being on the bleeding edge, uh, stuff that's not even out. So, uh, folks watching, Visual Studio 2022 is being worked on right now as we speak. Um, we are on, I think, preview four, and uh, yeah. you already have just stopped working on Visual Studio 2022. Yeah, uh, we have. Actually, I have a demo that uh, I can show. Okay, we would love to get to it. And also, looks like you got stuff working on .NET 6 bits, which is uh, still in preview. Uh, we are release candidate one, so this is amazing stuff. Uh, so, looks like um, we are, we are we're done looking at stuff. Uh, we can actually look at some demos here. Uh, from yeah, Misha, let's, so, let's make uh, demos. Yeah, let's uh, let's switch. Uh, and uh, if you're ready, Michelle, I'm going to give you the stage so you can share. Uh, yeah. I can just find you real quick. Uh, there you are. Okay. Okay, so I guess I will start with the Linux support. I will. Uh, can you see my screen actually? Yes, yes, I see it. Yeah, okay. So oh, nice. I, I see Linux. This makes me so happy. Yeah, uh, one of my colleagues uh, created a uh, quick demo, so I will uh, uh, just execute it and explain uh, what uh, happens. So uh, 
in this uh, folder, demo just mock examples, uh, we have the just mock examples that are delivered with the just mock installation. And uh, what we can do is uh, dot net test. Uh, we, uh, sorry, dot net test. We can execute the uh, examples with uh, without the profile uh, enabled. And we can see that uh, most of them are failing. We have just three unit tests that uh, do not uh, rely on uh, just mock. And uh, now I will execute a small script. Uh, hey, what? Yeah. Linux. So uh, I started the script and I will uh, explain what it does. So in order for the just mock to be worked uh, in the unit testing process, uh, it um, the CLR should load the just mock uh, profiler uh, as uh, just mock depends on the profiler to do uh, the heavy lifting of mocking uh, everything like like I said, the, the static uh, API, the sealed classes, uh, uh, or future instances of uh, some some class. So what we are doing here is uh, putting some uh, environment variables. Uh, uh, the first one is just we are saying that yeah we have just mock here and uh, we want to have an insta instance. If we don't have that, the profiler will be loaded, but uh, it will skip all of the instrumentation and uh, it won't work because this is um, some tool that you can actually uh, configure whether uh, a specific uh, uh, process or test should actually depend on just knock or not. And uh, the other uh, variables are uh, purely for the um, CLR just to notify him that uh, there, there, the profiling uh, is enabled and uh, which is the exact profiler ID and where that profiler is located. And currently uh, the path is to the just, just more commercial uh, version. Uh, you can see that from the path Linux 69 bit. Uh, 64 bits. And, and, and what type of Linux box is this? Like, are you remoted into this? Yeah, I'm remote uh, into this, and uh, yeah, it should be Ubuntu. Uh, okay. Yeah. So just let's check what happened. So uh, what we have done is uh, built with that script uh, the unit tests, uh, and all of them passed. And this is for .NET 5. Uh, it would be great if I had the example for .NET 6 with the release candidate, but I guess <laughs> it will be for the next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is super fun. This is amazing that you can run on Linux. Yeah. So uh, the next uh, big uh, uh, feature is uh, our support yeah, the, uh, for uh, Visual Studio. Let me just show it. This is a Visual yep. Studio uh, 2022, a preview nice. version, the latest one. format preview 4, there we go. Yeah, preview 4. I have uh, started already the debug process. And as you can see, there are no invocations. I will select the uh, mock arrangement that we have done. There are no invocations. And when we move uh, forward with the debugging, uh, you will notice that. Oh, I see that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the red dot that is actually telling you, hey, something happened here. And when you click on the invocation, you can see that uh, there's some invocation and uh, some information. Right. And if you click somewhere, we can continue with few lines. Let's see a few more. Come on. Yeah. So you get more uh, we can see that uh, the the new invocations are boarded, and by clicking them, you let's say read them. 
And uh, yeah, that is something that uh, brings your attention to the, the invocations that are uh, that uh, happened uh, when you didn't uh, look for them. And yeah, that's just to 2022. Uh, so this this is very very nice because uh, like you said like you you can be looking at a different tab and you just don't want to miss uh, your unit tests being involved and, and now you have a trace it it tells you with the red dot exactly what you have missed and once you click on it you see the multiple invocations yeah yeah, yeah you can uh, you nice. may watch on the on the um, uh, watch window or somewhere somewhere else and you can just bring again the the just mark the book window. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this all like looks so simple. Like here you have just mock support for Linux and, uh, you know, .NET 6 and Visual Studio 2022. And it's just so easy to say, but it takes a lot of engineering efforts, I'm sure, for you and the team uh, to pull, pull this off. So thank you. Thank you so much. And um, in the Q&A panel, like um, Nicholas Reed was asking, like, if they are starting up uh, an application C Sharp and Blazor, how can they use like just mock? Uh, maybe I'm not understanding the question right here, Nicholas. So feel free to elaborate. But I mean, if you if you're writing C sharp code, you're good to go. You can do this uh, on anything, any anything C sharp. Uh, you should be good to go with just Spark. Yeah, that is for the uh, let's say uh, the backend logic. Logic, and uh, if you are talking specifically for the front end uh, uh, related to the Blazor API, there are stuff that uh, you can actually mock with. Uh, with Blaze, uh, with uh, just mock, let's say some kind of services uh, when they are loaded. If there are some events that are triggered, uh, when they are triggered, uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. So would would you say, uh, Misha, like the best place is to check out the docs? Like, do we have any um, information on that? I, uh, especially in the documentation, uh, we don't have for uh, examples for different technologies, but we have a, a blog post about them. So I I think I wrote uh, one last year about Blazor okay. and uh, yeah yeah I remember that yeah so yeah Nicholas uh, in the Q and A please uh, uh, and drop us a little bit more uh, in terms of your question we can point you to uh, some blog posts that might help yeah or if you can uh, you can open a support ticket and we will yeah, handle absolutely. it absolutely yeah we we are here to help. All right so this is pretty cool this is amazing stuff from the JustMock team uh, so exciting. Uh, and I know um, uh, Misha here, you wanted to ask a quick question, but um, is there anything else you wanted to show on your desktop uh, before I take uh, the screen back? No, that, that was it. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me go back here and uh, <clears throat> I know, uh, let's see, show my screen, yes. And uh, let's go back here. I know there was a question you wanted to ask uh, for our audience here. Um, so quick poll. Uh, quick poll for you all here. And this is kind of a classic question, right? How are you unit testing your legacy code, right? We, we are trying to uh, work just mock. We are trying to give you all the solutions, uh, but how are you doing it today? Uh, is that working for you? Or is there anything else uh, we can do? Uh, so the easiest question is, I don't write unit tests at all. Uh, but uh, I, I guess most of you do care. Uh, but then are you refactoring and, and then writing tests? Or are you using mock and frameworks? Um, so tell us uh, tell us what you're doing right now, uh, and again feedback.celery.com. If you want to see any um, any features uh, in JustMock that you uh, are really really caring uh, but you don't have it yet, please please tell us. All right, uh, going once, going twice, and uh, let's see the results. So Misha, you have um, you have folks that you may want to uh, win over a little bit because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like a lot of people test their legacy uh, code. Yeah, uh, we know a, a lot of reasons that uh, people uh, have to not do it uh, in terms of budget, time, and it just works. It is hard, but, right? Uh, it, it is hard. It takes a yeah, lot of investments. It, it, it uh, most of us like if if stuff is working like we don't want to touch uh, legacy code but again at, yeah. at some point you're gonna have to touch it or modernize it and uh, then you would want that uh, code coverage uh, so uh, I, I um, kind of encourage all of you to kind of take a look at what just mock uh, can do for you um, and Misha and the team are constantly thinking about uh, different ways in which you can mock 
um, like different language constructs as well as uh, services and other things that you are reaching out to from your legacy code and how we can make that transition a little easier for you. All right, so Misha, thank you. Uh, I see like uh, your your window's going dark. It's like late in the evening yeah. for you. I'm still on East Coast time, so it's uh, it's good for me. But thank you so much for uh, staying on board and uh, showing off all of our cool You're stuff with Just Talk. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, uh, last stretch here. Uh, we uh, we have kind of saved uh, the awesome here for the best, if I may, because uh, it's my good friend Andy. If I can have you come back on, please, and talk uh, talk about Test Studio with us. Hey, Andy, there you go. Hey, you and me are wearing the same shirt. Oh, nice. Okay, good. All right. So let's memo. talk about, yeah, we got the memo, the other student. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's talk about testing because uh, this is so key to our enterprise workflows and uh, we don't talk about this enough. So I'm glad that we are able to give you uh, a good, uh, more than actually half an hour here uh, to talk about all the cool things because I know you and the team have been busy. So before we start, like let's just say I am a developer and I'm uh, I'm not buying into this idea of like the dev loops uh, getting tighter and I need to work better with my QA testers or you know just incorporate any type of automation in my testing. Um, what is Test Studio? What does it do for us? Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, Test Studio is a workshop to create automated tests. Uh, whether you're doing that with code or without, uh, we've got a tremendous amount of, of options uh, and, and uh, a couple different interfaces to allow for both non-technical and technical uh, testers to, to be involved and to really ultimately speed up the automation and speed up the life, uh, the, the cycles essentially. Yeah, so like uh, Misha was just talking about this, like, I mean, this is the reality. Like, I mean, we might be uh, having the most grand ideas about our app, but it comes to delivery and uh, CI, CD pipelines. And then this is where your unit tests are important. This is where your actual testing is important. Um, so some of this will actually plug right into my uh, test scenarios, right, as, as I'm shipping software. Yeah, and I think it's a great uh, showcase today. You've got, of course, the unit testing for your code with just mock. Um, you've got the Fiddler Jam, the Fiddler Everywhere for the, the tracing and the support kind of compatibility and uh, tracking and so forth. And, and of course, with Test Studio, it's, it's more about uh, making sure there's no regressions, making sure that when you deploy that you haven't broken something or you haven't forgotten something. Um, so, you know, being able to actually go to sleep at night while tests are running and waking up yeah. to see hopefully passing tests. Uh, and that is, that is well said, yeah, that's well said. Like we, we really are talking about like the whole, like the end-to-end -end, uh, software lifecycle here. So I, I know you and the team work a lot uh, with Test Studio, uh, but uh, is it fair to say like this is the only test to, tool that kind of works with all of our stuff as well as any modern technologies that you can think of really? Yeah, I mean, we have a distinct advantage when it comes to working with our own technologies, but we do work with any third party or custom uh, web controls that, that may be out there as well. So not a problem, uh, bring it to us and, and we can help you automate it. But when it comes to our own, you'll see there are some extra bits, uh, mm -hmm. some really some uh, uh, extended capabilities that you get when you're when you're automating against our controls. Yeah. Because we know our stuff, uh, a thing or two about our stuff. Um, but I, I wanted to also pick your brains. I, I've, I've seen this slide from you uh, in the past, but this is like so, uh, this makes things real. Like this is the whole DevOps life cycle. You're talking, you know, developers, uh, unit testing, uh, managers and QA and folks who are you know, like any type of stakeholders. Like you're saying, like everybody has a stake in this, right? Exactly. Yeah, we, we have taken... What traditionally might have been a slow part of the process, a painful point in the process of of doing that testing, doing that QA uh, process, and potentially that that in many cases is still done manually, and and that is very difficult to fit into a continuous delivery type of world to try to keep up with those manual tests, but those are key. So what we really decide uh, tried to do is develop a tool that can empower those manual testers to still do what they do but then deliver it in, an, in a faster way, in a way that can keep up with this agile life cycle that we see uh, you know, on, the, on the daily basis, essentially. 
Right, right. So I, I like the fact that we are catering to uh, different audiences here. Like if you want to go completely codeless or no code, you, you have that too with automated testing, but then you can also script and you can add your codes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of catering to the developer audiences. All right. So that's kind of uh, the broad overview, but um, uh, you had a big release, right? And and when was the test review release? Um, actually, it was just, I think, uh, last month. We, we have had a service pack since then, but, uh, but yeah, we do have a, a slightly different release cycle yeah. than the main R3, but uh, a little staggered. But yeah, it was, it was yep. about a month ago, I believe. Okay, cool. So let's talk about all the new and cool things. Uh, but uh, uh, like, like this is, uh, I'll, I'll let you speak to this. This is continuous delivery, right? Yeah, and I mean, this is what we're hearing from our customers uh, out in the world is is that really more and more, you know, you can't just push testing off to a separate cycle. It needs to be involved in every cycle. Um, you, you need that peace of mind knowing that something can move from uh, from staging to production and it's not going to ruin your, your user's experience or, or break your application. Um, so, yeah, the, the need to deploy, the need to test more frequently is there and and that really puts a challenge on a on a team that might have either some legacy tooling or as i mentioned more of a manual process uh, or a lot of customers come to us with what i call a bloated coded testing process where all of a sudden their testing project is just as large and daunting mm -hmm. as the application itself so that could be a bit of a mess but we're here to help yeah. clean that all up yeah, I've been there. I've been there. All right. So, um, how does this really support the test engineer? You want to talk us through this? Yeah. So the this release, we really wanted to bring out some of our best features uh, that that really have been there, but bring them out in a way that's more obvious. Make it more of a suggestions as to you know here's what we think the problem might be. We've got a nice uh, bit of AI that's already built into Test Studio that can help define and determine what may have broken and some suggestions that can help you fix a broken test. But what we really try to do is, is make it even more user friendly by bringing that stuff to the surface. And so you'll see that when we jump into the demo side of things. But this also enhances the collaboration between QA and development. And I know that's an interesting loaded term, right? Because some people think, well, QAs and devs don't collaborate, right? But, you know, and, and Eve pointed it out in Fiddler Jam, we do a very good job in, in Test Studio as well, gathering what we call failure details so that we eliminate the back and forth of what happened, what were you, what were you expecting to happen, what machine were you on, all that stuff gets answered by the data that we generate. Yeah, yeah, well said. All right, so um, let's move on. Um, oh, it looks like this is uh, the is code from Mike Goodwin. From the yeah, we Academy. See, we see a lot of advance. We hear a lot of feedback from our, our customers saying, you know, we were spending uh, a week doing regression testing on an application and now we're spending a couple hours. Um, and then, nice. you know, going from a hands on manual process to something that is, you know, automated and that really that really allows you to focus on what's broken instead of wasting time figuring out something works. And that's the that's the testing paradigm. You may spend an hour going through a workflow to make sure it works. And once you prove that it did, you kind of wasted an hour because it worked, right? You're looking for the stuff that's not working. So this really shifts yeah. that. And, and I think our, our customers recognize that. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. All right, so more on the release highlights. So we're talking about um, simplified test debugging. Uh, you got WPF support on the latest stuff and HTML frame automation. Yeah, the, the simplified debugging, that's again, kind of bringing the failure information, the data that we gather during a failure and, and making it easier to identify what failed, why it failed, and potentially what you may need to do to fix it. So we're taking it a step further, whereas before it may have been more of a, here's the data, good luck. Now it's, hey, here's the data, and we think this might be the problem, or try this out next. And it also has helped us bring some of the features in Test Studio um, kind of into a more appropriate workflow for the for the users. And then, of course, .NET, WPF, uh, .NET Core support for the latest version. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of customers that are constantly modernizing their applications. We've seen a huge trend in WPF 
since the yep. new .NET Core, uh, and a lot of people that were hesitating on on going to a more modern uh, uh, WPF kind of application are making that jump now. So of course we needed to do the same with testing, make sure we can support uh, the newest and latest versions of those WPF applications. Yeah, well, and, and this is so great because we, we, we talked about this during the Telerik uh, in the webinar with the, all the for .NET stuff. Like you look at like something like WPF, which has been around for like 15 years now, and yet it runs on the latest .NET 6. It runs with latest, uh, like you can build on it with latest Visual Studio. So your, your test, testing has to uh, be in line um, with where modernization is. Definitely, absolutely. And of course, the frame automation, these are things that we we do in the background. Um, you know, web component supports, another one that came out last year. Like things that we are doing that are automatically on, automatically there, kind of some of the unsung heroes of, of release uh, features that, that don't get the, the buzz or the, or the glam that they, uh, you know, the debugging kind of things might get, but they're there and they're doing their jobs. And that's really a, a testament to our team. Uh, they spend a lot of time not only working with customers gaining feedback, but also looking at the industry. Frames is something that we really have felt it hasn't gone away. Um, no. Yeah, there's trends away from it, but there's still a lot of applications that are relying on frames. So for us to basically improve and update that ability is a, is a huge thing to make sure that our customers can continue to work with those, those technologies. Absolutely. Um, so um, let's let's talk a little bit more. Um, I'm actually curious to see what you have to show. Uh, but you're talking about uh, step failure details. Uh, what is this about? Yeah, step failure details are really, you know, and, and Eve alluded to this too on the Fiddler Jam. I mean, that conversation between what's not working in the application. If you can think about a, a manual tester communicating a, a bug that they have found to a developer. That can be a, a difficult and lengthy conversation, and it makes collaboration hard. When you know, hey, what what did you do? What what steps did you actually follow? What to, uh, well, even maybe what time of day was it? Did you get a screenshot of the issue? All of this data that can be um, very rich and, and helpful in you know figuring out what went wrong and how to fix it. Uh, we actually do a great job of gathering that for you. And making it easy for an, even the non-technical users to look at it and determine, you know, can I, uh, is this an application issue or is this a test issue? And can I fix this myself or do I need help fixing it? And I love put, putting that question out there uh, because really if they determine, hey, this is a bug in the application, they can push a button that says submit bug, takes all of that failure details and sends it up to your source control, your bug tracking system. And, and it creates the feedback loop from development, from sorry, from QA to development, to you know really eliminate that back and forth. You know, here's all of the data, uh, even uh, you know the screenshots and recordings and things like that. Yeah, yeah, well said. All right, so um, oh, you got more uh, here on the WPF desktop operation, which you which you kind of already alluded to. Um, so I love the fact that like we keep calling stuff legacy when it's actually running your business. Like that is real. That's not right. sort of legacy. <laughs> so yeah. So you got support for um, WPF running on framework core .NET 5 and .NET 6. So that's amazing. Exactly. All right. So um, more quotes here. It looks like Michael Bolton. Uh, the problem is not yep. that testing is the bottleneck. The problem is that you don't know what's in the bottom. <laughs> that's that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's it's difficult. There's those paradigms in testing, right? That, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you you spend all that time making sure something works, and if it does, it's kind of like wasted time all of a sudden. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's look at our your stuff. Uh, let's look at some of these things in action. So, if you're ready, I'm going to give you sure. the floor and let you share your screen yeah, real quick here, and transfer. There you go. Perfect. Let me know. I guess when you have it. That's coming up. There we go. Yep. Awesome. So this is Test Studio in the dark theme, by the way. I know there's a lot going on, but uh, you know, for those of, that are just seeing it for the first time, you know, as I mentioned, this is kind of a workshop of test creation, test maintenance, and then of course you'll package your tests and test lists, and those are called from your CI/CD process, or potentially can be scheduled uh, to run on a regular basis by Test Studio. So when we step in here, we're looking at um, 
a test here in the middle. We've got tools around the walls, around the outside here of our workshop for different jobs we might be doing um, throughout the process here. But this example I pulled up here, I call this my parent flight search test. And I got a couple of variants in here as well. But uh, one thing I'd like to point out, and, and this is really one of the goals of this project called Data Dancing, is to kind of showcase how we could do things without code, and of course also do things with code. Um, there's always that option in Test Studio. And of course we have a .NET based framework under the hood, so you don't have to go learn a new language you know, to work with Test Studio. And in fact, for our non-technical users, they don't have to learn to code. Um, you know, very much we can, we see that we can eliminate, um, basically we can automate most about 80 to 90% of the tests without any code and keep them that way and maintain them that way. So what that means is when I look at a, a test like this, that's uh, in this case using a, a blazer control to do some looking up of flights, for example, um, this is the format that we see a test, right? A codeless type of format. This came from a record capability, so it automatically captures the uh, elements that you interact with and the actions that you take against those elements. And in this case, what I've done is I've taken that and I've actually data-driven it, again, still without code. But here you can see just all of these properties really kind of showcase how, you, how much you can manipulate and change things without having to you know, go to code, essentially. So let me show you what this example does, and then we're gonna break it, because really what I wanna show you is one of those new features of uh, you know, failure information and how it's presented. Now, I do have a coded solution, so for those of you that like the code, um, this is a quick little step, uh, a date time now uh, add, uh, where it's going to add 10 days uh, to uh, create a variable called plus 10 days, and add hey, 20 Andy. days. Uh, yes, would sir. you mind like, bumping your fonts up a little bit, please? Like it's just on the code? Yeah, let me see if we can get you there. Yeah, there you go. There we go. So as you can see, we're setting an extracted variable called plus 10 days using the daytime dot now dot add days to convert that to, uh, to a string and essentially store that in a variable. Uh, so I'm doing that twice, once for 10 days out, once for 20 days out. What this acts for, what this does for me, especially when you're automating a scheduling component, uh, your data source can get stale. If you have a spreadsheet full of dates that you're using to data drive that, you'd have to constantly update that spreadsheet as those dates pass and age out. And for scheduling, you're typically scheduling things like a flight, typically scheduling those in the future. You can't really schedule those in the past. So, you know, to work with those applications, uh, this represents what I would call a, a setup routine, essentially, that's gonna go prepare some variables for me that get fed into another uh, subtest here that will actually use those variables. So this is the sort of coded way of doing that. Um, just to contrast to this, I also have uh, another date calculator in here that does this in a codeless way using a function we call, we call extract and actually in this case using a date time calculating website. And I could show you both of these variations, but essentially this is the idea that there's typically three or four ways to, to solve every problem in Test Studio, and usually three of those are codeless, and then there's a coded way to do it as well. Of course, there's many variations of the coded ways to do it, but that's a great ability where, if you remember that slide where you had the little needle kind of going from technical to less technical, a lot of customers love to see this. They're not adding technical debt to their uh, to their projects by having these types of tests. Um, you know, if this can be done codelessly, then the non-technical testers are empowered and they can actually keep and maintain this test and and be more involved in that uh, in that process. So I'll show you how these work. Uh, and I am actually using this parent test to call what we call test a step. So just showing off features here, I know it's, it's it's horrible, but this is where you can go grab tests from your project uh, and and build a modular type of approach. So you know, if I was shopping and I need to add something to my cart, here's actually a whole subtest that's going to be called dynamically to execute uh, after uh, after we complete that flight search, or, for example. So you can kind of build these building blocks of tests and and make big scenarios out of them, like a login test 
may feed into another subtest where you're navigating to you know an admin section of your application which then may go to another subtest that updates some records there or something like that uh, so that's kind of what you're seeing and we'll go ahead and execute this uh, I'm gonna use some annotations here too so we can see more of what's happening our tests are cross browser compatible so as this spins up it's going to ask me which browser I'd like to uh, execute on um, and the one of the options here too is Chrome headless we have added headless execution which again if you think about taking what manual testers can do and move that not only to automation and speed things up but now even go headless you can speed that up even more um, between a headed and a headless test it's about three times faster to run a headless test so with that CI CD pipeline we're seeing a lot of interest in, in that headless execution I'm gonna go headed so y'all can see what's ha actually happening and I'm gonna hit up uh, chromium here Edge. so the head headless is the way you can go to sleep and still let your desks run well even headed you can let them run but it you know it does occupy a browser it does run your mouse and keyboard with headless it doesn't right um, it, it makes it very simple so here we have some controls in the middle and here you can see it injecting my 10 days out and in the end it should inject the 20 days out uh, date and then at the bottom there it's just going to verify that we've got the return date that we expected so we should get a green on that we got a pass there is a log file that's generated now not a whole lot of data for a passing test so I'll show you the uh, the failure here and what that does so to to break this test I'm gonna actually just come in and uh, turn off this test step that was data driving the uh, plus 20 days and that should in turn fail my verification which is looking for uh, that 20th of October essentially currently so just by doing something like that that should ruin uh, our test here and give you all a good feel for what it looks like when you have a, a failure so this particular version that I just ran is using the coded variety and again I can show you this with the sort of codeless approach too. I love this scenario because it came from a customer of ours years ago that said hey I have uh, this this look of this uh, scheduling test and I need some I need some dates to be able to feed into that test and I had a script um, oops I don't think I hit execute my bad guys but I had a script that my developer built for me to calculate these dates and that script is broken and that developer is gone can you help me and I said yeah I can help you we can fix your broken script but you're not gonna be able to fix it next time it breaks so let's let's set you up for success why don't I teach you how to build a codeless setup routine and, and at that point I never heard from him again because he was completely happy and had his own abilities to, to maintain his test himself um, so that's why I like to show not only the coded story. but the codeless version as well so this time we'll see this failure occur it's going to take a little longer to run uh, because it will be as you can see the bottom right it is running a timeout and we have both a way to find elements with uh, find logic and secondarily a way to find elements with images so it will probably run into the image uh, search at this point since it failed to find it with the logic and now it's come back and we see this now you see nice red, now you see more info. yeah lots of info lots of data um, here on the bottom right ob most obviously uh, the images we can blow this up this is going to show us the expected state on the left the failed state on the right and this ideal I mean this is great right away when you have a failure you're typically wondering and this is a very very basic example we are not switching pages we're not reloading anything really um, you know a lot of applications when you complete a process might move from page to page and uh, with test studio uh, you have this timing and this pacing that's automatically built in but you can also adjust that timing very easily as well too um, so in this case it uh, it looks the same ideally but except the the return date which is what we we're trying to verify and uh, that's what failed essentially the expected states nice because it does highlight that with that red box so that's really good 
Um, for a QA, again, answering the questions, is this a test issue or an application issue? Or, you know, can I fix this myself or do I need help fixing this? So here in the description, though, we could see it was trying to uh, do the verification. It was unable to locate the element and it shows us here how it was looking for it. So currently, there's lots of ways to work with Find Logic in Test Studio. Currently, I have this one using a text content. There's certainly other alternatives to this depending on the way the application's created. Um, so, you know, an ID or a uh, ARIA label or a, a NG data, you know, depending on technologies you're working with, there may be different ways to identify it. So this is basically telling me, hey, we couldn't find it this way. Um, we also have the complete test log. So here are the steps to reproduce the issue. This is automatically cap captured for you. Uh, you can see the timing as well that it took to run. You can see some of that failure information here. You can see where it was unable to locate it with the backup search. Um, and it was found with a backup to the backup. So Test Studio looks for it based off of find logic first, image second, and even if that image fails, there's a backup that it keeps running uh, to see if it can find it by weaker and weaker methods. So it did find it by a very weak method. Um, potentially, it's going to give us some suggestions. We'll see what that uh, includes here in a minute. But this is really great information. We've got browser and version number. We've got you know, date and time kind of stamp information, timing it took to run, failure information. I mean, really all the steps you need to reproduce that issue plus the images, right, that go with that. Another thing that's here, uh, and may, maybe not as much for the non-technical users, but for the devs, uh, the DOM, the document object model at the point of failure. So we can see, you know, what was going on behind the scenes when that failure occurred. But this is this is gold. This is great. Yeah, and here you have a way to take action, right? So we can we'll look at a few of these, but copy and export are ways we can get this information out into somebody else's hands. And submit bug is an integration point for us. I have mine pointed to um, actually an Azure DevOps instance, and it's going to populate all this information for me and attach the failure details. So this little button push is the feedback loop from dev to QA. Um, so that sends it up to Azure with Very all nice. of the information uh, so we don't have to have that back and forth conversation about what was supposed to happen and so forth. Yeah. So and, and, and the dev opening this has like the full DOM, like the full visibility of exactly what happened. Exactly. Those log files, those image files, the page DOM that all gets uh, shipped with that bug and attached to the bug as well. So this is stuff that's been around with Test Studio, but this presentation of it is what's new. And obviously making it a lot more obvious that, hey, there's a failure. You know, we've got red here. We can, we can tell there's an issue. But then further, the suggestions below. So because it was a failure to locate an element, it suggests finding, you know, updating the find logic. Or uh, we actually, I already had run this with annotations, but that is a feature that helps you um, see a little bit more easily what's happening. It highlights things. It slows down execution a little bit to help you see and inspect things. Uh, so that's running it with automation. And then of course some alternative solutions. So what happens here if we need to update find logic? You can see that it opens up the current find logic for that element, which again is using text content and combining that with a tag name. Uh, so a generic plus a more unique identifier so this is how we locate elements, not on a path, not on an index, you know, not based on somewhere on the page, but wherever it may be, as long as it matches these properties. So that means responsive web apps, responsive layouts, we can work with, our tests don't break because of that. Um, you know, across browser, our tests don't break because the way it's finding the elements uh, is very sophisticated. So the suggestions that we got here did come from a path. If you recall, this logic failed, the image failed to find it by an image. So it kicked in that backup search, which eventually found it by its X path, which means that it essentially resulted in it looking in a place that we expect it to be and bringing back what it found in that place. So this is kind of cool. It actually found April 10th, uh, 2020 in there. And it, so it's, it's, it's saying, hey, is this what you meant? So it's giving us this as a suggestion 
hey, maybe I maybe I had the wrong text content. Let me go ahead and just swap that one in. Maybe delete this one, and we'll fix that, right? So it's really easy to update a broken element uh, just from your your failure information here, and also validate it against the uh, the DOM at the point of failure. So when you click validate, it will run that against the the stored DOM, which is also here. Uh, so if you like DOM, you want to work with DOM, you can certainly get in and do things from here, uh, even uh, replacing elements or copying things, looking at properties. So it's a UI-based tool to keep your elements up to date, to fix them when they when they change or break. Um, and, and that really saves a lot of time. Being able to just jump right into that from this failure uh, can make it very easy on you. What do you think of that, Sam? Indeed, no, this is super cool. Um, and, and the ability to be able to work on this like for Blazor or like WPF, like you're, you're covering a wide gamut of technologies here. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, let me fix this test up. We'll just turn that step back on that we had there. And uh, let me give you this opportunity to see this codeless setup routine. So all I have to do here is turn off my coded setup routine, turn on my codeless one, and because these are both under the same parent, uh, that gives me the ability to, to share data from one to the next. Well, it just so happens I used the same variable name in my code as I did in my code list. So I don't have to change any variables or bindings. Those are all using the same variables. I'm just feeding that with a different uh, uh, test rather than the coded version. So what you're going to see this time, and uh, actually we'll turn off annotations, so we'll run a little more quickly. But what you'll see this time is the codeless version, the codeless setup routine. Now I get this, you know, when we talk to people about using these types of, of options, um, a codeless setup routine in this case is relying on a third-party website to go calculate the dates for me. And then it's using a function we call extraction that can grab values from the UI and turn it into variables. Um, so some would argue, well, you're relying on a third-party website to create that data. You know, what if that site goes down? Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of these out there and a lot of them that are used pretty regularly for testing. So what that's just doing there is going through and clicking the dots. Oops, I think I clicked the wrong one there. But it clicking the, the dates and then feeding those into the next subtest. Got to make sure I didn't uh, leave that turned off. There we go. There we go. And our bindings to data drive these are very easy. You can just essentially type in the variable from the other test that we're passing it from and click set. And that's how we get our data driven functionality there based off of that. So we'll give that another run here. Let me make sure I left this the way we need it. Uh, here you can see that extraction step where you can name your variables whatever you'd like. And as I'm expanding these steps, you can see all of the options that are here in the way that uh, that's that's uh, allows you to modify the behavior of the test. So a common thing might be, well, I want to simulate the typing of this number 10 rather than injecting it and maybe do the same for this 20 as well. So those are very quick, easy changes that have a big impact on the way the application is behaving and, and the, the way that it uh, responds as well. So we'll rerun that, see if we get a pass that time. But that's, uh, I mean, that's really it. So, you know, as I was saying, you know, relying on this third party site to, to uh, calculate some dates for me, versus relying potentially on a third party developer who might have to maintain my code for me. So it's kind of one or the other. I mean, you kind of run into the same issue at some point where you've got, uh, essentially you need some help or you have to fix something that's broken. Um, and that's the nature of the testing world, right? So I know we're getting close on time. I will uh, we'll go ahead and let this run as we can see here. It's using that, uh, typing and extraction for us and now passing those variables to the other test here and there we go we've got a passing test that's all great no hands right automation's nice. great isn't it 
Indeed. And uh, I know, Andy, you can you can talk about this all day. It's like kudos to the team for putting out stuff uh, that is so uh, appropriate and relevant for the type of different types of apps we're building. Okay, so Andy, uh, like I said, we are running up against time. And do I do have a couple of questions that we might want to address? So, um, if you're okay, Andy, or I mean, is there anything more uh, quick you wanted to show us? Ah, uh, no, that's that's all I have for you today. All right, so uh, stay in there. I'm going to um, have you respond to one question here, Andy. But uh, before we do that, let's do a quick poll of the folks uh, who are here. And I'm going to switch over back to my screen for a second. And uh, I know, Andy, you and the team wanted to ask this question. So quick poll here for you folks. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, Andy, they can, uh, folks can still hear you. So. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you face in testing? Uh, and Andy, I'm sure you have experiences with your customers on uh, which ones you see as the biggest roadblocks. Yeah, and I, I've, I mentioned a couple of these, but uh, you know, technical debt seems to be trending. Uh, I don't want to sway the votes any in any specific <laughs> way, but uh, I mean, we hear about these all of these, you know, on a regular basis. Um, you know, but I'd, I'd say also there's there's a difficulty in uh, people really relying on on manual testing, and I think you can't necessarily get completely away from it because it's usually the folks that know the customers best, the users best, and know the applications best that can really put your application through uh, through the test. What we're doing is we're allowing those folks to be able to be more involved in in the automation process. So creating these tests is like hitting record. And running a manual test, it's going to capture what you're doing. Um, you also can put in those verification points and things along the way. So uh, it really does empower the non-technical users, but also the uh, the technical folks as well. Yeah. So uh, folks on the poll going once, going twice, and let's do done. And actually, the results are kind of right in line with what you are expecting here, Andy. And it's true, like the the quality of your automated testing like depends squarely on your testing tools right and uh you know manual testing is also hard uh, to kind of keep up like you're building up that debt um now not in code but also like in your manual testing so without the right tools uh, this stuff is hard so yeah so there you have uh, the results here folks and uh it's kind of in line with what uh, andy i think you see from our customers um, so um, we are at time. Uh, I want to ask like two quick questions here, and then um, uh, the other folks here, Eve and Rick and, and Misha, feel free to come on. Um, and uh, Andy, I wanted to start with you here uh, for a quick Q&A. Uh, one of the questions was, um, uh, let's see, uh, Nicholas uh, was asking, uh, how do you use something like Test Studio with um, like with your dev cycles? I think the question is like more generic, like with TDD. Um, uh, do you see customers using this as a part of their dev cycle or uh, like at what point do you see customers like uh, doing testing maybe as an afterthought or are, are you seeing folks who are having more success who think about this from the get-go? Yeah, it's starting to happen more and more. I mean, applications can be developed with testing in mind so that they're more testable. Um, but I think with this panel too, and you know, Rick, not to exclude you, but the uh, as far as the testing tools, I mean, we've covered with with Mihail the um, you, hopefully your unit testing with JustMock, right? Once that application UI is developed, then Test Studio gets involved, and we start to functionally make sure things work, and then protect against regressions from happening. And then, of course, if there is something that goes wrong, that's where Eve and Fiddler Jam can jump in and capture those traces and communicate to the support with all of the details. Uh, Sure, we can get some reporting in there somewhere too, but <laughs> hey, yeah, like without you reporting, you, you, yeah, you don't even have a complete workflow. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, exactly. I mean, folks, what we're trying to do is kind of really complete the end-to-end -end life cycle and give you all the tools that you might need uh, to enable your success. And uh, one last question here, and, and these things may have been already been answered in the uh, Q and A panel, but uh, do Test Studio and Fiddler. Uh, work with apps that are developed in other languages like Java, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to scratch my head here. Like, uh, are you building web applications with Java these days? Which, I mean, if it's a web application or anything that makes out a call to 
a service endpoint, like Eve, correct me if I'm wrong, like Fiddler can do do it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, Test Studio, like uh, uh, Andy, do you have uh, folks uh, utilizing other languages or other platforms? Well, really, we're, you know, from a web application standpoint, it really doesn't matter. Um, as long as we can get to it in a browser, we can we can automate it, and that goes all all the way into data viz, SVGs, and canvases, and PDFs, and stuff like that as well. Yeah, there you go. So get it, get it, get your apps in the browser, then we can, uh, then even uh, Andy can step in and do their thing, and their teams. All right, folks. Uh, so we want to be uh, conscious of your time. We are a little over, but this is good stuff. This is a good problem where we uh, have uh, a lot to talk about. Um, just a quick shout out. If you are uh, just want to come and see us um, uh, kind of um, code our applications uh, live on the internet and make a little uh, fool of ourselves, we are always doing that uh, multiple times in the week uh, on our Twitch channel, so Code It Live. So come and hang out with us. And uh, we want to thank you for uh, spending like two hours of your day with us. Hopefully this uh, provides value to your end-to-end -end application life cycles and all the things you have to think about to successfully ship your applications and keep providing value uh, to your customers. So um, Rick, Eve, uh, Misho, and Andy, uh, I want to thank you and uh, like tremendously for uh, letting me just be your slide monkey and uh, you did uh, all of the uh, really hard demos, demos. So thank you so much. Uh, and a big shout out to our folks as well in the, in the back rooms for answering all the questions and supporting us. Uh, like I said, we really uh, stand on the shoulder of our giants, our engineering teams and our product teams uh, who put out quality stuff. And uh, yeah, we are invested in your success. Uh, any other lasting uh, thoughts, folks? That was a great closing. All right. All right, folks. So so that's it. That's it for this release. Um, you can see us uh, keep our wheels uh, churning, and uh, we'll see you um, uh, bright and early next year. But again, uh, we do things in between releases as well. You've got service packs and like Fiddler and just uh, and then Test Studio have slightly different release cycles. So keep an eye out. Uh, you know where to go and find the products. Uh, keep an eye out on the blogs. Uh, tell us uh, if you're anything you, you're struggling with through the support channels and anything you want to see in the products, the feedback channel. So with that, uh, we're going to let you go here, folks. And uh, thank you so very much uh, for hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, this was fun. And uh, we hope to do this again with you soon on the next release. So until then, thank you and stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.